Let me pray for us. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for the privilege of gathering to worship you, to encourage one another. And we pray now as we reflect on your word that speaks so powerfully to us that your spirit would open our hearts and our minds, that we would be transformed uh, ever more to become more like Jesus as we await our, that final destination of glory with you for all eternity. This we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, uh, no doubt you've all heard the uh, saying, short-term pain, long-term gain. And there's all sorts of things in life, aren't there, that seem costly or like too much hassle or bother uh, when we consider the short-term uh, aspects, but if we consider the long-term ones, then uh, there's great gain to be had. And obviously, I think a, like a great example of that is if you wanted to plant an oak tree in your, in your yard for, for uh, shade, you would get a little acorn, uh, uh, which is, you know, yay big, and you'd pop it in the ground, and uh, there'd be a lot of tending to the soil required, and watering, and looking after it, and pruning, and helping it to grow, and 150 years later, you'd have a beautiful big oak that your great-great-grandchildren would be sitting under and marvelling about the tree that had always been there, and the wonderful shade that they get, uh, and... Uh, you, you would see very little of the gain for your pain, but uh, generations later would. Short-term pain, long-term gain. Same thing when I go to the gym, right? Uh, I don't really uh, ever want to go. Uh, I don't like uh, finishing exercise and literally having nothing else to do but basically fall on the floor for a while. I can't speak to anyone. Uh, all this new cleaning that you have to do because of COVID, basically other people have to clean for me because I'm still too dead after the exercises. Uh, and uh, yet, long-term gain, I, I notice I can go faster and get, be fitter and uh, have more energy for life. Short-term pain, long-term gain. And uh, that kind of idea is, I guess, a little bit like what Paul uh, has for us today in Romans as we get to uh, this next part of Romans chapter 8, where Paul tells us that as Christians, he sort of foreshadowed it last week at the end uh, uh, of our reading in verse 17 uh, and expands on it more now, as Christians, we, we're going to have to endure short-term pain but that this pain or, or suffering that we will experience as Christian pales into insignificance almost when compared to the long-term gain of the glory of God. But before we dig into that a little more, let's remember the facts, where we're up to. We know that uh, we are God's children, Paul said back in uh, the start of chapter 8, because we have believed the gospel and uh, received the Holy Spirit. Chapter 8, verse 14, those who are led by the Spirit are the children of God. And as children, uh, we get this special relationship with God. So because we've been saved by God from our sin, because we, Jesus has been uh, died in our place and the wrath of God has been removed from us, uh, we now get to have this special relationship with God, not estranged and wrathful, but the deep intimacy of a child with his father. And so Paul says, uh, by the Spirit, we cry, Abba, Father, in verse 15. And, verse 17, Paul said that because we have this intimate relationship when we put our faith and trust in Jesus with, with our Heavenly Father, we become heirs of God and co-heirs of Christ. And what that means is that we're going to share in, in what they have which is glory. We, we get to share with, with God and Christ in their glory for all eternity. But if we are heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ, Paul says, if we indeed share in his sufferings in order that we may also share in his glory. Before the realisation of our inheritance, Paul says, before the joy of glory, Paul says, suffering comes. Just as it did for Jesus, who suffers death on the cross, 
so too for us as Christians. Life on the road to glory is led via suffering. And that kind of makes sense, doesn't it? If we think about the theological realities of our existence as Paul has described them so far. Because Paul has told us that we have been made alive by God's spirit, but that we still live in bodies subject to death. Remember back in uh, verse 10 of chapter 8, if Christ is in you, then even though your body is subject to death because of sin, the spirit gives life because of righteousness. And again in verse 13, Paul talked about how we have to struggle against the misdeeds of the body. He's talked about how creation groans in eager expectation, waiting for its salvation. The effects of sin are still there. And if we are living as God's people, uh, uh, given new life by the Spirit in uh, a body affected by sin and a world affected by sin, then it makes sense that suffering would happen. Not just suffering because we're Christian, but just like general, the suffering existence that humans have of sickness and illness and uh, disaster. Suffering is to be expected, in fact, required for the Christian. Now, it's interesting when you, when you think about this, isn't it? Because we don't run many uh, promotions like this. Uh, I, I, I'm not bringing to parish council when we next meet a, a, a motion that we should attach a new sign with LED lights to the, to the front of the church property that says, uh, join us today, suffer tomorrow. Um, it, it's, it's not really a great kind of marketing technique. And of course... We've got to remember that this is chapter 8 of Romans. Like, uh, this is more, this is actually not Paul's kind of uh, great call either. His great call is the wrath of God is on you and Jesus is going to fix it and you're going to become a child of God. That's the good news. This is more like the set your expectations right as you then seek to live out this good news. And it's really vital that we get this right, that we get this truth, that though God has done a wonderful thing in saving us when we were his enemies and reconciling us to him through the death of his son, as Paul talks about in Romans 5.10, though salvation has come for us, though we've been given the gift of the Spirit and we can be called children of God and we can have an intimate relationship with God as our Father, our lives will still be hard. And not every Christian gets this right. There are plenty of people who, who take all of that good news and promote this kind of over-blessed Christian life. They say, become a Christian to live a good life now. There are books called Your Best Life Now, written by Christian pastors and they don't mean your best life now because you're with Christ they mean you're going to actually have a, a, a by worldly standards enjoyable life and it's all sorts of kind of wonky theology that doesn't set expectations up correctly for what it means to have a blessed life what it means to have God as your father what it means to live for God in a broken and sinful world. Let me just give you a quote uh, from a, one of these American mega pastors who uh, just so misses the boat. They say of our desire to, to worship God, I want to encourage you, every one of you, to realise that when we obey God, we're not doing it for God. I mean, that's one way to look at it. But we're doing it for ourselves because God takes pleasure when we're happy. That's the thing that gives him the greatest joy. 
So I want you to know this morning, just do good for your own self. Do good because God wants you to be happy. When you come to church, when you worship him, you're not doing it for God, really. You're doing it for yourself because that's what makes God happy. Amen. Don't anyone say amen. <laughs> but what, what's Paul saying? He's saying, we're going to inherit the glory of God and that is the best thing ever. So much better than our happiness. So much more amazing. And that's the thing that's actually going to sustain us through life here and now, which may not be happy at all. Next week, when we finish off Romans chapter 8, he's going to say some great stuff about the conquering life that we live in the love of God. And we do experience that as Christians, but it's in a world broken by sin, affected by sin. You call yourself a Christian today, you're not going to be given a free pass out of suffering. Your life's not going to be easy, but you are going to be doing it with God in his strength and power. And Paul says, verse 18, I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that we will be revealed in us. You see, as we live our lives and as we go through our sufferings of uh, interpersonal relationship breakdowns or natural disasters, difficulties at work, uh, whatever it may be, death of loved ones, suffering because we're Christians. As we go through these different things, Paul reminds us that there's something greater that is coming. It's worth persevering. It's worth keeping on going, keeping on holding on to Jesus through it all because ultimately we are going to experience the full glory of God and somehow share in it and somehow it will become our glory too. And that is going to make these things that we experience now uh, pale. They, they can't even compare to the glory of God. I just want to think about that for a moment. Our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. We can keep going through the worst of the worst today because whatever it is today, the worst of the worst, doesn't even compare to the glory of God. Like, let's think about what Paul's saying here. The, like, one of the worst things that I can imagine happening to me is one of my children dying. I think that would be horrendous pain, suffering. I'd be devastated. I don't know how I'd get out of bed in the morning. And yet what Paul tells me here is that the glory that awaits me is going to outweigh that. It's going to surpass it. It's going to be far more wonderful and beautiful than the deepest of pains that I can imagine. Or if I get beaten and tortured for my faith and lose all my possessions and, and am desperately sad and lonely, the glory of God is going to surpass this. And I'm going to inherit that and that's going to, it's not even going to compare. The ups and downs and the bumps and bruises of life in the here and now surpassed when the glory of God is revealed in me and you as God's children. And what I've reflected on as, I, as I've kind of been thinking about this is what a small view of the glory of God I have. Because, honestly, it's hard to imagine when you think of some of the worst things you can think of, it's hard to imagine God's glory making them seem relatively insignificant because of the wonderful thing that you now have 
with the glory of God. But that is the truth. God's glory is that good, that marvellous, that wonderful, and yours to be shared in through Christ, that you can keep going no matter what has happened. And when God's glory is revealed in us, what happens? Well, all creation will be liberated, Paul says in verse 21. Uh, There will no longer be sin in in the world in which we live. And our bodies, verse 23, will be liberated from their uh, enslavement to sin too. We will experience this perfect life in perfect relationship with God with no external sin uh, no, no sin in our body. Uh, it, it is going to be just the most wonderful, glorious, amazing thing. The glory of God is a good thing. But we're not there yet. And we still do suffer terrible things in the here and now. So what to do in the meantime? Well, Paul says in verses 24 to 27, hope and pray. For in this hope we were saved. But hope that is seen is no hope at all. Who hopes for what they already have? But if we hope for what we do not yet have, we wait for it patiently. In the same way, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. We do not know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us through wordless groans. And he who searches our hearts knows the mind of the Spirit because the Spirit intercedes for God's people in accordance with the will of God. Hope and pray. This is the, 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 the survival guide for the suffering Christian waiting glory. Remembering that the glory of God will be ours. We will share in it, our suffering will end, creation will be free, our bodies will bear sin no more. The true promises of God will come about. And in the meantime, we pray. We allow God's spirit who who, who has come uh, into our hearts to birth prayer in us in the midst of our suffering. Of course, as we suffer, it can be hard to know what to pray. But the Spirit intercedes for us, helps us. And we pray for the Spirit to help us to to continue to hope in in what is to come, to persevere in our faith, to overcome sin where we can and allow God's Spirit to continually conform in us to the will of God. As we live a, a life with suffering, hoping and praying in light of the future glory of God. As we persevere, remembering God is our Father, we remember God is for us. And we know, verse 28, that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. For those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters, And those he predestined, he also called. Those he called, he also justified. Those he justified, he also glorified. God will work out all that happens in this life for your ultimate good. Somehow. Now, as you read those words of scriptures, as I remind you of that truth, let me not let you hear me minimise your hurt or your suffering or your pain. Let me not not hear hear you or hear these uh, words of scripture say that uh, your sufferings, your experiences, your deep pains are good or right. Rather, the, the, many, for many of us, the sufferings and the things that we experience are the fruit of a creation and a humanity subject to and groaning under sin. Our sufferings are not good. Not at all. We all know that too well, unfortunately. But in God's goodness, he somehow works through these horrible things for our good. 
And this is like one of those moments where it's important to remember that the right way to understand the Bible is to understand it first and let it interpret our experiences rather than the other way around, letting our experiences interpret it. Because I believe that this is true, that in all things God works for the good of those who love him. I believe this is true even in the worst of tragedies in my life that I can't explain. Uh, two people in my life uh, have drowned and died. Uh, one, once my friend, when I was in grade two, when we were on school camp together, another, more recently, uh, a friend of mine uh, who was my personal trainer who went fishing with his four mates and they all drowned and never came home. Now, they were... Like, both of those things were terribly tragic. Both of those things caused me deep grief. And, and they both sucked. And I don't know how, but somehow I trust that God is using this terrible, tragic thing for my good. Somehow God has worked through these things for good. Somehow they're going to pale into insignificance when compared to the glory of God that will be revealed. I don't know why four young men would go on a boating trip and all drown. It doesn't make any sense to me. I don't know why someone in grade two, what an eight-year-old boy, would go on school camp and never come home to his parents again. I don't know why. I don't know how but I trust God's word. God works for the good of those who love him in all things. And in all things there is talking about the sufferings, the sufferings that we will experience as Christians while we await for the glory that will surpass them all. Or take COVID-19. What on earth is going on in our world but God has used COVID-19. Uh, and this is, this, is, this is sort of, I guess, the opposite example where I can't explain those tragic things. Uh, another bad thing, COVID-19, uh, I can't explain it, but I can see here how God has worked for good. Again, speaking personally, uh, as we went into those stage three lockdowns, I learned a little bit about who I was trusting in and my lack of trust in God. When the restrictions first hit, I spent a long time worrying about money. Would, I, would, would our family have enough money? Would our church have enough money? Uh, then I got worried about my family. How, are, they, are they gonna cope okay? What do I need to do? How am I gonna keep them uh, safe? Then I started worrying about how I could manage uh, the, the, the demands of my family and the demands of the church at the same time in the middle of this pandemic. And as all of that was going on, and it was all quite difficult and hard and bad, somehow God worked through all of that to reveal in me a, a misplaced trust that somehow I'd started to trust in my own strength way more than <laughs> was a good idea. And that I needed to trust in God. I needed to give him control in these areas. Now, that doesn't make the lockdown good. It doesn't make those worries or those experiences good. It doesn't make me want to go back into lockdown so I can learn more things. But God works together all things for the good of those who love, love him. That's what the Bible says. And sometimes we see it in our experiences and sometimes we don't. But regardless, there's a future glory that's going to outweigh it all. And if you love Jesus, 
and if you put your faith in him and if you've stopped trying to prove yourself by a written set of rules and are instead trusting solely in the grace of God that he's got you, then he's going to keep using your sufferings to mould you and shape you and work for your good and then one day the glory will come. God has got you through all this. That's where Paul finishes this section. For those God foreknew, verse 29, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. He's got you. As he shapes you and as he sanctifies you, uh, as you uh, work out the fruit of his calling on your life, you can be sure that the glory will be yours. For those he predestined, he also called, and those he called, he also justified, and those he justified, he also glorified. As you put your faith and trust in Jesus, God's salving, sal- God works his salvation in your life. As you keep trusting him through your sufferings and he works them for your good, he's working out your salvation You're becoming more like Jesus. And for those whom God calls and justifies, who who put their faith in Jesus, who are saved, he promises that glory will come. You can hope and pray with confidence because of God and his sovereign plan for your life. So as you face suffering today, Suffer well. Suffer with hope. Keep the faith. Persevere. Run into the loving arms of your father because you are his child and he loves you. And there's an eternity of glory that you cannot even imagine that far surpasses the worst of the worst that you'll experience today. Amen. Thank you.